Welcome to Under Construction. I'm Donegal Callan. Later in our Suppliers Corner, we'll be hearing from Aidan Cullen from Wood Concepts. Thankfully, the barriers around chatting about our mental health have fallen. And what was once a taboo conversation between any of us on site is thankfully the norm now. To help us continue to break new ground and navigate the challenges in our industry around mental health, we are delighted to be joined by Richie Sadler and Willow White. Lads, you are very welcome to Under Construction. Let's get it done. Richie, you're probably blue in the face with this question. So, Willow, I'll go straight to you. Who should get the Irish uh, soccer job? You know Robbie Collins. <laughs> 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 Who should get the Irish soccer job? I would give, uh, I'd give Keane a go. Seriously? Yeah, I would, yeah, yeah. It, it, it can't be, can't be any worse than what's out there in there. Yeah. I just coined that, it. That's not a great <laughs> argument. <laughs> Couldn't be no, any you, worse. Richie, don't ruin this for us. We're going with pure fantasy. So who would be your new fella, Richie? I have no idea. Right, yeah. I wish I had a better answer, but I don't know who the credible candidates are. I don't know who's affordable and available and who'd be doing it for the right reasons. Richie, can I ask a question? Just mm. John O'Shea going into the role, why, why put a full stop on that? If you're going to give the guy a chance for two games, don't, uh, like, just for me, I would say, why, why would they say we're looking at someone beyond it? Just leave I, have I, a go. I think what they've done, and we're trying to interpret what's going on the, in the FAI based on very few statements, in fairness. Yeah. It's not like a, a leaking sieve that it was over the previous years. But what they've said, about John publicly is it's an interim appointment and he's not a candidate for the job, which is another way of saying he doesn't meet the criteria we're looking for. In in layman's terms, he's not good enough at the moment. You would hope that whoever takes it genuinely, you know, it goes in with, with, and and not just a pie in the sky belief, but that it's based on something. That they can win and say, I can get a tune out of this. Because in international football, you, you you can't sign players, you can't, massively change your squad. You can tweak it a bit, but you still have only a very small yeah, group of people you can pick. So hopefully someone will come in and be able to take the group of players that are there to a level that we haven't seen from them collectively yet. Mm. And some of them are young lads that may just improve because they get more experience. Evan Ferguson is the obvious one. Um, so hopefully that'll be the case. Yeah. yeah, and I suppose as a player's point of view, if you're playing the Premiership and you've got the rights to go and play for Ireland and you've got the rights to go and play for England. As an Irish man, I would be more inclined to go and play for England if I could. Jeez, Willa. No, but no, 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 there's no, 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 Willa, if you lost a plot, that's man. the social media just, clip right there. You know I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, sorry, no, Willa, like, get there's, out. There's, like, there's <laughs> nothing, no, I'm saying, like, like if I'm a plastic paddy, if me, if me grandparents were, or, uh, were Irish and I got you know, to go ahead to play. I mean, Ting done it. What was his name? Grealish uh, done it. Yeah, Rice Gre- done So you're saying, basically, if you were a player that had two options and you didn't have the allegiance you have in your mind at the mm. moment, you could see why someone would go like, with why, the Why am yeah. I going to be attracted to playing for Ireland? I mean, realistically, and, and it hurts me to say this, the track record the last few years has been atrocious. Like, well, look, wait, you know, I'm glad, listen, I'm going to finish on a hoy. I'm going to finish on a hoy. I'm glad I was a lawyer for Italian 90. Yes, yeah, here, here. And I'll tell you what, here, in fairness to Charlton what age were you I was 11 I was in around that yeah I was kind of 10 I I was 19 I was in my prime I probably could have gone on for the last 10 minutes. <laughs> you should have used it. You straight in for Cascarino. <laughs> but it played for Ireland back then. No, but uh, come here. No, I, I was 19 and it was, uh, I was living in London at the time as well. It was amazing. Ah, we're chatting uh, about mental health today. Yeah. You haven't uh, helped me in mine with, with that opening comment. But just in broad strokes, lads, are we getting there around mental health? Or is the conversation going in the right way, Richie, is, as a, an Irish public, are we more receptive to chatting about feeling a little bit down? Well, we're going to have a conversation now, which is going to cover loads of different topics. And I bet it's the kind of conversation that would have been fairly rare or not heard of at all if you go back 10, 20, 25 years ago. Definitely not. There wasn't groups of lads sitting around going, let's just kick around the topic of mental health. We'll share personal experiences. We'll talk openly about what we've been through for no other reason than we just think it's worth doing. Yeah. That would never have happened in the past. Like I work in the field of psychotherapy, so I'm in the kind of mental health circles for years. And so I started in 2012, I think. And back then, like there's even a huge shift in, in what I've seen. Like 
companies wanting to have mental health days or mental health talks or mental mm -hmm. health seminars in the world of sport. We talk about the mental health of the athletes as opposed to them being just highly paid lads that are there or women for there for us to shoot at them if yeah. they don't meet the bar we set for them. So it is changing in terms of conversation. There's a whole other chat to be had about the services and where we're at and what's needed. But I think in terms of people's openness or availability to have chats about how they're doing, I think we're absolutely going in the right direction. Yeah. Will I, you'd find that? Yeah, definitely. I totally agree with what Rich has just said. And even if you go back four to 25 years looking at my father's mental health and the, the year and the generation of men that he hung about with, I mean... I never, none of my dad's friends went for runs or went to the gym or went sea swimming or any of the good stuff. I went to men's groups or spoke. I think everything was really dealt with a lot of the time sitting on a bar stool in the public. Mm. You know, people's dreams and ambitions and you didn't really talk about your feelings. There was a, there was a persona and there was a reputation and there was, you know, your image and your ego, the kind of, that you were a hardy kind yeah. of walking man. And if you did suffer with your mental health and you had stuff going on, I don't think the, the, the help was there for it. I really. don't even think the vocabulary was there at the time to even call it that. Yeah, well, yeah. The no one would really acknowledge it. I think I need to address my mental health because I'm a little bit off killed her without I don't think mm. people would have considered it in those terms. They just called you another point. Get him another point to Guinness. Yeah. You grant. You just good or bad days yeah, and get yeah. on with it. Yeah. That was my sense of what that era was like. And I wonder what it was like for them to actually for someone that actually was really suffering with their mental health health to be able to get up in the morning and just kind of put their feet on the ground and go, here's another one of these days like that I'm going to really struggle to get through. Thankfully that's changed. It, like that band-aid of toughen up, get get on with it, that mentality, you know, get Willa another point, he'll be grand. That's mm. gone. It, uh, I feel now if you reach out, you will get caught. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The help, the help is now there and the question is, do you want the help? And are you willing to ask for the help? And it's a lot easier, I find, with my personal experience, as much difficult as I thought that it was at the time, to go up and approach somebody and say, listen, I'm struggling and I need to dig, I need to dig out here. Yeah. And, and I think it's a brave man that goes and asks for the help. And, and I think it's a, it's a frightened and scared and confused man that sits with it on his own and thinks that he can sort it out himself because you can't. It, 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 it's safety in numbers. I always say it's a lot easier for a group of men to push a truck than it is for one man to push it. If you've got people pushing with you and helping you and trying to resolve the problem with you, uh, the problem then kind of becomes a solution and you can move on and do something about it, you know? That point you make there about putting your hand up and, and saying I'm struggling with be it addiction or whatever it is, mm. like it does require incredible bravery. Yeah, it, it really, really does. And I mean, I know for me, from my past, I know he suffered with mental health as a young man, uh, really, really badly. Um, I, I, I've got a history of addiction, childhood trauma. Um, I've got an, I've got a, a, I suffer from what I diagnosed as generational trauma. My father suffered with trauma in his family. His father suffered with trauma and it was passed down onto me and my escape was to take drugs and unfortunately for me, for taking drugs from a young age, um, I started to suffer with my mental health. Um, I was putting drugs into a, a young boy's body that shouldn't be dealing with stuff like that, that should be grown and evolving naturally the natural way. And I was putting chemicals into my body that were not only messing up my body, but more so messing up my head and messing up the growing and, and my words were just getting sent the wrong way and crossed the wrong way. And, and unfortunately for me, I ended up in three psychiatric hospitals. I ended up in London when I lived in London. I ended up in a psychiatric intensive care unit in London for nearly seven months, which was very, very frightening. Been suffering with psychosis from drugs. And um, I thought I was going to be in this place for the rest of my life. And I passed by it in November. I passed by the hospital and I looked up at the window where I used to sit there and look out and think to myself, I'm never getting out of here. I've been kept here for the rest of my life. And then, and then ended up coming home and then ended up in Dundrum Central Mental Hospital and then ended up in Vincent's in Fairview uh, Psychiatric Hospital as well. So it was like three times I ended up in these places and just still after all that hadn't got the help thing in me to say to people, 
I need help. Like I was on psychiatric daycare clinics and, you know, attending psychiatrists and, and all that stuff. And to come through it and get through it and to be able to sit here and be able to talk about it and, and eventually somewhere along the line through my addiction, being able to ask for help um, is, is probably one of the reasons why I'm sitting here. That's an incredible moment like for you. At, at that point in your life, do you kind of, are you nervous that you're never going to have a moment like this? You know what I mean? That you're never going to have a fulfilling life. Like, how do you get from that point? We're sorry, no disrespect. I couldn't imagine it, mm. but that you end up here and like what, what changes? I think something changes inside each individual. And the changing moment, I suppose, for me, and I can remember it, I was in Mountjoy prison and I got extradited home from England and uh, I was doing five and a half years prison sentence with a review after three and a half years on terms and conditions that I looked after my my addiction issues and I got a moment of clarity one day sitting in my cell and I knew a prison officer and I said, I really need to do something about this. I knew if I got out of prison and I continued to do, you know, it's like that saying, you know, and I'm sure you've heard it, uh, Richie, if nothing changes, nothing changes. Mm. So if I was not going to change anything, I was doomed to do the very same thing that I done every time I got out of prison, which was just go and use drugs and get back into active addiction and back into that whole world of self-sabotage and low self-esteem and all the negative stuff that comes with that. So I went out and I asked for help. I asked the prison officer, Mark Farrell, his name is, and I only met him before Christmas in Mountjoy and I hadn't seen him since. And the two of us met in the auditorium in Mountjoy and we broke down crying. He started crying and I found it. For him, I found it a lot more difficult because there was prisoners off the wing that were there and he was dressed in his prison uniform. And I thought, I had so much respect for this man for breaking down and shown his emotions and his vulnerabilities to these prisoners that were still in the prison with him. But I'll forever be grateful for this man and I, and I just thanked him. And um, if it wasn't for him, Jesus, God knows only where it'd be, you know? And I, and I... Fucking hell, whatever about the bravery of you in that moment. Yeah. The, you know what I mean? The bravery of mm. him as well. You know, like you're, you mentioned in his job, but he caught you. Yeah, he caught me, but he, he he was there, like, and when I asked for the help as much as I thought, I remember walking up the landing and thinking to myself, everybody is looking at me here. They all know I'm going to ask for help. And there was nobody could have given a flying mm. what I was doing, like. But I was so self-absorbed and self-centred, I thought it was all about me, and that's what my addiction done, where I was a broken, broken man. And when I asked for the help... It was like a, a valve was after being released. That was like the pressure had just come out and went, look at and 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 he said, look, I'm gonna get you the help. And I got the help and I went into detox in the prison and I, I started going to a 12 step program and then I went to a drug free part of the the prison and, and, and things just started started to move and started to evolve. And I just it's like I said there a while ago, I had bags of rock bottoms. Like, you know, people say, oh, you've got to hit a rock bottom. Like, I mean, I had a menu of rock bottoms. I mean, how many, you know, but I just knew at that time, it wasn't that, it was, it was like a moment of clarity where I went, you know what, you're destined for so much more than this. On the 4th of, of, of April this year, please God, a day at a time, I'll be 23 years without a drink or a drug, like, you know, so, and, and so much has happened in my life since then, you know. Good on you, Will. When did you start to get hope that actually being clean and sober and living a fulfilling life is actually in my future? Jeez, that's a great question, eh, Richie. Because um, you're describing a scene mm. or a life or a situation that's, to most people listening, they go, this is as bleak as, this is the bleakest picture. That's it. And you're sitting here now as the healthiest picture. What, like, it's a hell of a journey. When I, when I, when I got out of prison eventually, I was, I was with a girl um, who was the mother of me two kids and, she was uh, she was actively using for the first five years of my recovery, um, which was very, very difficult. And she eventually got herself together and, and sorted herself out. And I think after them five years, I got that thing where I said to myself, if I can get through that, I can get through anything. Yeah. And, and my whole mantra is every day, 
is that um, no matter what happens today, I'm not going to drink and I'm not going to use. Regardless. You know, I've I, I done loads of stuff in recovery. I learned how to play golf. I learned how to play squash. And I've done different things that I always wanted to try stuff that I had great dreams and great ambitions about doing and done a bit of acting and ended up in a few things on the television and obviously ended up doing the stand-up and done a play all about my my addiction and, and with another guy who was like, he, he was an ex-victim of crime and I was an ex-criminal and we got this beautiful piece of theatre together and I've done loads and loads of stuff. But what, what I'm trying to say is that I have got no excuses to take drugs. I know now how to live my life without the use of a drink or a drug. Um, I lost my only sister um, in 2010 through, through cervical cancer. My sister Susan, she died at 44 years of age and that was devastating. Um, and I lost my father in 2016. And this was a man that I had a lot of hatred for, but a lot of fear for from and still instilled in me growing up but in recovery I got to see a different side of him and and I got to find out what it was like for him growing up in a family of 16 children um, in a two bedroom tenement flat in town where they were basically starving I spoke to my uncle about it and my uncle said that they used to eat the fruit out of the bins in the fruit markets and I couldn't fathom that you know and he talked about his father who was my grandfather who I don't really want to talk about because I don't really think he deserves the airtime. It'd be probably the best way to put it. And I don't really want to speak, speak ill of the dead either. But I learned to cultivate a relationship with me dad and to understand and to forgive and to accept what had happened, that he had no tools. Like what you talked about, Richie. My dad didn't know what to do with his mental health. I didn't, didn't know who to talk to or what to do. So unfortunately for him, he drank and was violent at home. And that was the outlet for him. There was no sea swimming. There was no, um, you know, going and doing life coaching or mental health or being able to talk to a therapist or anything like that. And when he died, it was only his anniversary um, there a while ago. When he died, I was with him and, 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 and I held him. There was only me and him in the hospice in, in Harold's Cross. And I remember him saying to me, the worst feeling you'll ever feel in the world is loneliness. And I said to him, look, you're not going to be on your own when you die. I says, I'm going to be with you, like... And it was the most intimate moment that I ever had with my father in all them years. And uh, I was able to hold him and I was able to love him and and I was able to be present with him and and be true to me word and tell him, look at you, you know, you're not going to be on your own, like, you know, and I miss him. I miss him terrible. I really do, like. And all you have at the end of the day is your family. I'm very aware of that. All over the years, the people that have only been there for me on the sidelines, when things were good and when things were lousy, was always my family, like, you know. My friend has a saying, how do you spell love? T-I-M-E. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. It is until you start hanging around with your own kids, you, you realise it's the truth. <laughs> you asked a while ago, have things changed? Like, mm. listen to him. I can imagine this conversation or someone speaking the way you've just spoken as openly as that years ago. I... I, I it was just, it, it wouldn't They'd have been. They'd probably that. put you into a psychiatric yeah. hospital yeah. if the truth be known. Yeah. Richie, on that, the acceptance side of it, not only from Willa there, just in, in Irish people, that ability to accept and be there to catch. I, I, I've, I've statistics here in front of me of research that Chadwick's have done, and it's in relation to the construction industry. 85% agree that most tradespeople are reluctant to talk about their mental health. That's what we're talking about here. Yeah. It's, it's whether it's a generational thing or a family culture, or an era, or whether it's an industry you're in, or a job, or whatever your perception of being a man is, if, if that's the limiting thing. But so many people can relate to that thing of going, I can't talk. I, ju I just can't tell my mates what it is I'm going through. Can't tell my mom, my dad, my partner, my friends, my colleagues, my manager. I won't survive the consequences of them knowing. Yeah. Whether it's they'll slag me, they'll reject me, they'll break my confidence and tell someone else what I've gone through. There's so many reasons which are understandable in the mind of someone who's struggling. There's so many reasons that people hang on to say, I can't talk here because there's nobody going to catch me. No one will understand or it, maybe it'll be worse if people know. Yeah. Countless, countless, countless examples of the power of just that simple thing. 
I was just going, whether it's whether you're in prison and you say to a, a one of the guards or whether you're in work and you say to your colleague, whether you're at home and you say to your partner, in, in some ways the circumstances don't matter. It's when you can cross that line where you go, okay, instead of silently struggling, I'm going to share my struggles with someone because the potential for change. There's no way in the world you'd be sitting here if you didn't have no. that conversation. 100%. And I walk in the construction industry and I see as a guy in recovery, the guy is coming in on the Monday morning or the Tuesday morning. Yeah, what do you that, see? I, I see desperation. I see lads that are afraid to ask for help. I see lads that are in fear of losing their jobs. I see lads that, like what you said, that are in fear of being judged, being laughed at, being called a clown, being called whatever. And I see that there's not, in my opinion, and this is my personal opinion, that there's not enough of a safety net to help these individuals in the construction industry. I think there should be more supports, and I know there is supports, but I think lads need to t know straight away that if they go to somebody in confidentiality and say, listen, I've got a drink problem or I've got a drug problem or I've got a gambling problem, whatever that might be, I think that company needs to back that individually 110% and they need to go, listen, we would more rather have you in work five days a week in the right frame of mind away from all that stuff. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to offer you a little bit of counselling with the long-term uh, thing to probably, if you need to, go into treatment or go on a 12-step programme or talk to a psychotherapist and try get through your issues and try make you a better employee for this company. Like, that, it, it, it's not happening a lot. You, you've outlined the brilliant thing that a bigger environment could do, like a big construction firm or whoever it is. But Richie, what about three lads in the van or one man in the van, which is an awful lot of the industry as well. Someone that has a trade, they work on their own, but you know what I mean? It, it, it's not... Do you know, so if you imagine that scene, there's two or three lads in a van and I, there could be two, three lads sitting around a pub table or off playing golf. It, it kind of doesn't matter where, where they are, but let's stick to three lads in a van at the moment. And and like us three. Yeah. And we've all got lives, personal lives, relationships. We've all had childhoods. We all have family situations, financial situations. We we all have a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And And if I've got something that I'm struggling with or is keeping me awake at night, or I know that this area of my life could be going better. And, and But if I think you two have got everything sorted or if I think you're just going to slag me or if I've all I've heard from you all week is you slagging the fella who you read about on the news that went to therapy. Yeah. And, and you've openly said, well, anyone who goes to therapy is X, Y and Z. Well, I know you're not an option for me to talk mm. to. And if, if all you do is mock people who are in any way struggling yeah. or if you keep telling stories of lads who cried sometime and you hammer lads, be, well, I know you're not an option either. So I'm going to sit there and go, well, these two lads are not safe options because they've revealed themselves to be someone who just aren't options. Yeah. And I think you've got to know that as well. Like there's a lot of talk about mental health. You know, it's good to talk as if just talking is the right answer. Choose who you speak to. Yeah, it's who you talk it's to. It's who you talk to. Because there are people who you'll say something to and go, oh, I regret that. Oh, I wish I didn't do that. But so to go back to that scenario, if, if you can create an environment in that van where it doesn't matter what yesterday was like for any of you, if you are open to talking about what yesterday went like or what your mood is today or what you're doing tonight or what your thoughts are on tomorrow, it doesn't matter. If it's just an open forum where you go, here's where I am today, then those three people have a better chance of dealing with what they're dealing with because they feel like they've got two people in their corner. And that's a world away from the fellow who's sitting there going, these two lads are just not options. Maybe I have other options, but yeah. it's not these two. So it's like kind of shifting the culture a little bit about what's acceptable. And it's not about everyone sitting around thinking and acting and talking like a therapist or a priest or a saint or someone who never slags or mocks. It's not about removing the crack from the van. It's just about acknowledging we all have stuff. None of us are superhuman and every single one of us at some point will have our head in our hands in life going, how do I get out of this? Or how do I get into this? Yeah. Or where do I go next? Yeah. Who, do, who, who do I... Who do I know that I can trust? Mm. Who's safe? Uh, who, who will help me? Or if they can't, they'll signpost me to someone who can. Yeah. It's that. And that, that's not possible if the culture is just 
too much mocking and slagging and criticising. Yeah. Like I would have had, I would have had that in Millwall dressing room. Yeah. Like the world of professional football back in the 90s is different to what it is now. You were 17 yeah. walking into that dressing room yeah. and everyone knows uh, about Millwall it is yeah. a tough club yeah. but you know. And in 1996 it was tougher yeah. than it is now. Um, so you, you go in and you kind of suss out straight away what, what are the what, what are the laws of the jungle here? What, what's accepted? And you look to all the lads, for example, and what's yeah. right and wrong and what's what behaviour is allowed. Nobody was asking for help. Nobody was talking about difficulties. Nobody was talking openly about struggles from the crowd or, you know, intimidated by supporters or the mental difficulties of being injured or the fear of the contract not being renewed mm. or the worry of who'll sign you because you know your contract is being, um, isn't going to be renewed. All that stuff. Loads of job insecurity in the world of football. Loads of reasons to that it would be difficult on any given day. Nobody was talking about the difficulties. Everyone was just fronting up as if there's a bit of crack and everyone, every room everyone went into, the, the, the expectation was you're the hardest man in every room you're in. And that was just the job. You stand in the tunnel before you go out on the, on the pitch, doesn't matter how many people are in the stadium, how better the opposition are or how confident you think you are in your own abilities, you're front up. It's but the same it, as the construction yeah, industry. It's the yeah. same you environment. Stand in, you stand in yeah. a drawing room before you walk out into the site. Like, realistically, even though you're probably walking with a group of lads and you're in a team, you're on your own, like. And it's like what the podcast says. Some lads really need to go under construction, like. They need to strip themselves down and they need to reconstruct themselves in order to go back into that environment and be a better employee, be a better father, you know, be a better husband, be a better partner. All these things... You know, and it's 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 going to continue to happen all the time. It's like a revolving door. You know, lads are coming in of a Monday morning, they're dying. They're only coming back around of a Wednesday. By Thursday, the money's gone back in the bank and they're doing the same thing all around again. And, and it's like I said earlier on, if nothing changes, Richie, nothing changes. You know, the help needs to be there. You need to be told, look, if you do go to treatment, listen, there's a, there's a, there's a, a fund there that's going to pay your mortgage and make sure your missus is okay. So that's the least of your worries. For, for some people, and I speak from my own experience here, you, you, so some people have to wait until it's crisis point. Exactly, yes. I totally and, agree. And, and totally you know, agree. Just when, when they, we all know what it's like to have a great day, you feel 100%, and then you're 90 or 80%. It's not ideal, but you can carry on. And you, you get lower down, you go, well, this is manageable. Um, but a load of people, myself included at various points in my life, you wait until you're on your arse with no room, no options, no other solutions. Yeah. And then you put the hand up and go, this way isn't working for me. Right. And in an ideal world, like you, you would hope we would all be able to acknowledge, we, we, you know, the graph is going in the wrong way earlier. Mm -hmm. I was seven, eight years in that Millwall culture. And then at the age of 24, retired because of an injury. So I'd know... So all my adult life up until that point was in the world of how you just maintain this posture of being this oh, all-conquering, confident alpha fella. Um, but then I was in this reality where all I was doing was crying. I was heartbroken um, and, and full of fear about my future, um, really resentful that this happened to me, but not the next fella, full of self-pity. Oh, poor me, geez, I don't deserve this. But all my friends were footballers and I didn't want to be around footballers because all they talk about was football. So I was kind of, I was withdrawing from my friends. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of isolating a little bit. And then this was at this first, so the first time in my adult life, I wasn't going to be randomly drug tested by anyone. And my head was carnage. I was drinking like a loon anyway. But now I thought, well, if I'm not going to be drug tested, I'll throw myself into that too. Yeah. So then I was all about bags and yeah, yeah. cans for, for ages. Mm -hmm. And so my head was a mess. But I was going on chat shows and Sky Sports News in my back garden and I was doing newspaper interviews, spoofing to everyone, saying all the things that the most polished answers, you know, I had seven or eight really good years and I'm grateful for that. And I've made a lot of good friends and, you know, I've still got my health and have the rest of my life ahead of me and yeah. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And, and none of it was what I believed. And then the cameras would go off or go home, right, cocaine, Kansas style. Yeah. And I had a phone, which was brilliant because I could just never answer it. Mm. Or texting was brilliant because you can hide your emotions by texting. Because no one sees your face or hears your tone of voice. You can just text. What did you have to do, Richie? Oh, I, I, things got really bleak in my head. Um, so I would have been 
like I contacted a solicitor and I made a will and, and that, that's where my, my, my head was at the time. I was going out with a girl um, who I knew from Dublin since I was a kid. Absolutely stone mad about her. But my head was a mess. So I, I knew I was going to sabotage that relationship, but I also didn't want her to be there to find me or whatever. So I somehow managed to get her to move out. Um, and I, I didn't act on those thoughts in, in, instead. I I made it I'm I made a decision which I swear to God it's it's probably the one I'm most grateful for in my whole life. I, I arranged a psychotherapy session for myself. Because right. at the see the at the time I didn't allow myself the option of telling friends mm -hmm. or former teammates or my parents or managers or my girlfriend. I just thought I just can't. I had no experience of talking this way at the time. I said, I can't tell them. But if I tell a therapist no one even has to know I'm going, let alone know what I'm saying when I'm there. Legally, yeah. she can't say yeah. anything. <laughs> All right, she's bulletproof. Mm. So I went there and, and some, it was weekly, sometimes twice weekly. Um, and then the first time I was crying in front of somebody. I uh, never done that before. And started giving the honest answer when someone would say to me, how are you getting on today? Never done that before. And then it just, it just helped. Yeah. Can't put my finger on why. I was still a former footballer. I was still a 24, 25 year old. They had no idea what was going to become of him. But it helped and it stabilized me. And instead of looking solely on the thing that wasn't in my life, I was able to appreciate there's possibilities there and what to bring into my life. I wasn't back to 100% and I was still drinking heavily. And the drinking and the drug taking got really bad then later in my 20s. But for the second time then in my life, I did the, the, the most straightforward but life-changing thing. When I was 32, I put my hand up and asked someone to give me a hand and try and stay off drink. Um, because I tried for years to drink less or better or mm -hmm. safely or manage it or... Or a different drink. Different drink. Oh, I won't... I, 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 in my teenage, I won't have cider. Doesn't agree with me. And yeah. I won't have this, doesn't agree with me, won't have this, don't agree with me. So I'll just have Guinness and Jack Daniels and that'll be it. And and it took to the age of 32 where I got to the crisis point again. Where I was like, okay, my ways are not working. I just need to ask for help. I need just to find someone who's been in my shoes, who's gotten out of it and see if they can help me with that. So I started getting access to 12-step programs and meetings and other people who were just able to just guide me and help me and kind of give you a bit of direction like all that I was crying out for it but yeah. I'd come from the background I'm from which a lot of people listening to this might be similar be like but we don't ask for help yeah we're lads we provide help yeah we support other people we don't ask for support ourselves mm -hmm. we, we're, we're just there we're dependable we're reliable all the things that I thought you had to be like the definition of a, like same in a rugby player, a, a footballer, you're, you can handle pressure. In adversity, you're the one you want beside you. Mm. you. You know, if you're in the trenches, you I want this guy next to me. And all of those kind of analogies and things conjured up the kind of person I thought I needed to be or had to be, which is a million miles away from the person I was. Mm. I was a mess. Yeah. I was broken. I needed loads of support. It's like it's like you've got a bag full of masks and you stick one on each time you meet a different person. That's all it was. You get lost in your own identity. You don't know who you are, and that's what recovery was like for me as well. Like I was in the contemplating stages of going, who who am I? Like I didn't know I didn't know who I was. You know, I knew I wanted to stop taking drugs. I knew I wanted to stop drinking. I knew I didn't want to take my life anymore because I got a, 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 a lust for life. I always hear that thing of people in early recovery going, oh, what, what am I going to do if I don't drink or I don't take drugs? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I wish they'd bring another day into the week. I've got so much you know. to do. Oh, like, there's so much. I, I remember being in one, one meeting in, in my first couple of months and I genuinely felt this. At the, I was single, 32. Um, and even back then, I would love the idea of being a dad one day and, you know, all, all that stuff you see in, in, with other people and, and things working out well on telly for people I remember sitting there going I'm never going to have sex again I'm because how could how can you do any of that sober how do you go on a date sober mm -hmm. who'd want to go on a date with anyone who's sober and what 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 reason do you give as to why you're not drinking if she asks you yeah. do you tell her 
The then, truth, do you lie to her? And then you're telling people that you don't drink and they're looking at you like you have a disability. Yeah. But it's, it's back to the question I asked you earlier. Do, would you have ever thought you'd be in a chair like this with the head you have now back in your darkest days? Never. I didn't either. Never. I would have been at scenarios where if you'd have told me in my mid-twenties, the day I walked out of the Millwall physio room for the last time, you know, your, your life is going to, you know, it'll have its challenges. There'll be loads of twists and turns, but you're going to get to a point where you'll sit in a chair and you'll talk comfortably about how you're doing today to anyone who asks you. And be comfortable in your own skin. Yeah. I would have gone, no, that's that's not my future. Yeah. But it's just these simple yeah. steps of just initiating a conversation with someone at the right time. Yeah. Going, here's what it's like being me. Yeah. And then that can go in so many different directions. And and the right person too, Richie, isn't it? Yeah. I don't mean to sound disrespectful in any way, but I I do have memories of teammates that would have come to me and been would have opened up and said, I'm struggling and like the environment, like the site, like the, the dressing room, big European Cup weeks, you're saying, get your hard hat on and get to work. Yeah. You know what I mean? Stop showing a weakness, you'll bring us all down. I feel real bad over that, but I didn't have the skills yeah. to be able to, to catch or to support. I hope this isn't contradicting myself. Sometimes that's the appropriate thing to say to somebody. Is, okay, you're dealing with this. I know you're dealing with this, but there's a job to be done and we need to collectively do the job. But we'll let's come back yeah. to this conversation. Yeah. But there, there is absolutely a time and a place for giving someone some kind of hard truths and go, listen, you're needed today. Mm -hmm. We need you today. And if it's if you're up for it, let's go and do it. But what you've just told me, this can't be the last conversation. Let's yeah. bring this up again because yeah. it sounds like this is more than a conversation. This is more than just a one-off event where you say what's going on for you. And and because that, then that process, like when I went to therapy, I had no idea what was involved. No skills of talking honestly about how I felt. But you just, it's like an exercise in faith. You go, okay, well, this has worked for someone somewhere. Mm -hmm. Maybe it'll work for me. Yeah. Or you go to meetings with other people who are in recovery. No idea why this will work for me, but I just know it works for others or you hope it'll work for me. Yeah, it's like if you sit on the sidelines, you're not going to get your game. Like, yeah. You know, you've got to get up off the bench and you've got to walk onto the pitch and you've got to tell people, listen, of course, I'm in a bit of trouble here. Yeah. And, like, and I totally agree with what he said about you saying to that lad, sometimes when you're in that zone, you've got to tell people, look at, this isn't the time or the place for that. Like, it's not that you're dismissing them or it's not that you're telling them, I'm not helping you. Yeah. You're just saying, you know, this isn't the time mm. for that, you the, know? The, um, the honest truth is, though, I wouldn't have followed up. In not being harsh, yeah. I would have I would have thought, and wrongly, I know that now, but it, when you're young and you're in it, you're just thinking, everyone's got to stay tough. Yeah, but isn't, the it, isn't, it, falls yeah, but don't get, isn't it great that you're actually even able to sit here now and admit that yeah. and be able to be accountable and go, do you know what? I could have done a little bit more. 100% or I could have. have done, but, but this is what we're saying. Myself, yourself and Richie are saying, we have now evolved so much to have the awareness, to know the signs. If someone's probably not, you know, firing on all cylinders, that you've got that to, to pull them aside and go, come here, yeah, okay, is everything all right? Yeah. Do you need a chat? That sometimes is what people need. Mm -hmm. For the people that aren't extrovert enough, that are too introvert to be able to approach, sometimes you just need to be pulled and going, do you want to get a coffee or something? And when you show them that you're there and you give them the shoulder to lean on, you know, and you hold a hand for a while until they can walk on their own and you can let their hand go. Yeah. It's just what they need. Like Because I think one of the things that a lot of people who are in, in, a, in, a, in a bit of a hole think, they think, well, I'm the only one in this. And, and and everyone around me's got sorted. Everyone else in the dressing room, everyone else in the canteen, everyone else in the van that I'm sitting in has got it sorted and it's just me. Yeah. Like, according to this, 62% say they've noticed others on construction sites that are struggling with their mental health. Like, that's more than half. Mm -hmm. Like, it, this is so common. It's it's not like a niche conversation we have having about an experience that only a tiny amount of us yeah. know. It. Everyone knows yeah. what it's like to struggle. Well, here's Everyone. The, here's the thing, Richie. Why should people on a construction site be stuck in a hole when the site's full of ladders? Do you know what I mean? Mm. I think that's fucking very, very true, isn't it? We've all got a hand to pull people mm. out, like, you know? Like a lot, of, a lot of people ask me when I, wherever I'm doing talks or whatever, 
they'll say, well, what, what do you say to someone if you know they're struggling? Like, how do you start the conversation? How do you get them to talk about what's going on with them? And I think on one hand, you have to accept that maybe they don't want to talk. Yeah. Or maybe you're not the person they want to talk to if they do want to talk. Yeah. Or maybe you're choosing the wrong environments to bring it up. So mm. your timing is off. So maybe that's that's a thing as well. But one of the most effective ways that I know of how to get someone else to open up honestly about what's going on for them is if I talk honestly about what's going on for me. Yeah, Every yeah. single time I, I can go into a, whether it's a corporate setting or a school or a chat around the table with a lot of lads in a pub. And if I talk openly about what I've been through, it just happens. There's a ripple effect and someone will go, oh, Rich, remember you were talking about addiction? I I was in that place as well. Yeah. Or you talk there about feeling low. Well, I was like that too. Once you talk about it, you kind of give everyone listening the permission to, to talk about that topic because you've yeah. the one that's put it on the table and you're okay with it. So you're telling them that, okay, well, he's okay with that topic being talked about and he just talked about himself. Mm -hmm. So no one feels confronted by that. You don't feel mm, vulnerable if someone else is talking about themselves. Yeah. If you're sitting there going on about you, it's nothing to do with me. Yeah. But it might just put me at the right amount of ease or comfort to go, well, Dunica's just told me he cried that time, whatever. Yeah. Maybe it's absolutely fine for me to tell him I cried that time too. And the reason I'm still crying is, is bothering me and it's keeping me awake. And then off you go. Yeah. So it's sometimes w we can give the most help to others by just being a certain way ourselves in front of them. Mm -hmm. Because we're talking about here about trying to break down yeah, cultures yeah. Or, or change yeah, perceptions yeah. of manhood or, or, or expand the, the list of ways that lads think that they can behave. And you do that by actions, not by words. Oh, 100%. And Richie, that's what I think. Like, I didn't know the answers, but I, I know now with hindsight and with life experience, I wasn't the man to deal with certain stuff like that, but I had brilliant team managers. I know I could have given one of those a tap and just said, you know, have a word or just can you check in on Willa? You know what I mean? It's mm. a small little thing that you could have been better with. I, I know everyone chats about the individual that might be suffering, but I do think if we could broaden the conversation out for people more to be more aware, to to be helpful. And you know what I think a lot of people underestimate because a lot of people say to me, what do you say to someone? Like, what's the, like, what's yeah. the advice? What's the, you know, the killer line? Yeah. What's the phrase or the yeah. analogy or the story? What, what's the thing you say to someone when they've told you their struggles that would make, almost like, what's the silver bullet? Yeah. And I think sometimes we forget the power of just shutting up and listening. Yeah. You don't interrupt. Yeah. You don't start telling them what they should do. You don't start giving them, jump in with your experiences. You just acknowledge that this person has taken a leap of faith here. They're talking about something which maybe they've never talked about before. My job here is just to keep the space for them to keep talking. Yeah. And that involves just listening. Well, you know, they say you've got two ears and one yes. for a reason. Mm. Yes. Mm. You know, and that's all some people just need. Yeah. They just want to be listened to. You know, some people are really good at listening and other people are good at talking. But when people need to talk and they're talking, just shut your mouth and nod yeah. your head. And acknowledge that you're listening yeah. to them and make eye con contact with them and let them talk. And, and if you think you've something useful to say, then say it. But if you think you don't and someone else might have a better role than you in all of this, suggest that person go and speak to them. Mm. Yeah. Or speak to that person if you've that person's permission and set them two off in a conversation. Like Because it's not about kind of taking on the responsibility yourself to make everything right for the person who's just opened yeah. up to you. Something you can support or you signpost them to a support. As well for me, I would think it's about knowing that you're not on your own. You're not the only one going through something like that. You know, like I know your uh, scenarios are incredible. Just family wise, myself and Jen starting a family, but Jen mis Jenny miscarried on one of our, our, our kids. But I'll never forget, I went into training and a brilliant team manager, he's passed away now, Jerry Holland, grabbed my elbow and he's, are you all right? And he, he saw, he knew something was up. So I spoke to him and, and he was there, listen, you're not the only one going through this in the environment at the moment. And over the course of, say, the next three days, loads of my teammates were coming up, just give me a tap. Listen, I know what you're going through at the moment. We've just been coming through mm -hmm. it. And all of a sudden I went from having this, all of my own thinking of us 
you know, it was just myself and Jenny going through this. Yeah. To realising, oh my God. Yeah. This is way more common than I would have even ever given appreciation for. Yeah. And so many people can relate to that, that when you go to something, you think n- no one else knows what this is like because no one else is going through this. And then you say it and then mm. you realise, wow, I'm wrong. Yeah. Like, there's loads of people. We are we the same. We, we yeah. m- Fiona had a miscarriage. We were years trying to get pregnant. We were doing fertility treatment. And again, this is a topic that I wouldn't have thought Ask me in my 20s, yeah. would, would you ever talk openly about the difficulties that yourself and your wife are having trying to get mm-hmm. pregnant? I'd be like, God, no. Because all those jokes or the whatever. Yeah. Are, yeah. Is, is the, yeah. And I'd be like, now, like, going, no, I, I, I know from experience how damaging for me personally it is to keep to myself what I'm going through. So I talk to trusted circle of people really regularly and openly about what I'm going through. And when me and Fiona started to talk about our troubles and difficulties with getting pregnant and loads of people yeah. listen to this know mm-hmm. what that's like. It's incredible, yeah. yeah. But until you open up about, well, I'm in this boat, you don't realise that others have the same experience as you and by you sharing yours, you actually benefit from theirs. Mm. Well, uh, could you tell us about the 12-step programme a little bit? And I, personally, I don't yeah, know it as yeah, well. Of well, course, uh, I have the yeah, knowledge. But. Uh, like, first and foremost, before I even say anything, I mean, 12-step programmes aren't for everybody, you know? So I think it's important for everyone to kind of to know that. I think whatever works for you and keeps you away from your poison, mm-hmm. mind being drugs, I mean, if it's working for you and, and things are going okay for you and other people aren't being affected... Because you've got that dry drunk thing as well. Like people think, you know, willpower is great to a certain extent for a lot of people. I look at willpower personally like putting tenors worth of diesel into a car. It's only going to take you so far, like, and then you've got to get out of the car. With the fellowship for me in a 12-step program, I've got friends and I've got people that are like-minded and are like me and have been through the same stuff that I've been through and know how to live life on life's terms, that have dealt with loss, that have dealt with grief, that have dealt with losing jobs. So if I need to find out, like when I lost my sister, I I spoke to lads that had lost people in their family and the last thing I wanted to do was use or take drugs. But it's just, I always tell people about 12-step programmes is that, you know, the difference between, it's it's not a religious programme. A 12-step programme is a spiritual programme. And the difference between spirituality and religion for me is that religion is for people who want to go to heaven and spirituality is for people who've been to hell. And I've, I've been to hell, like, and that's, I like that kind of twist on it. I'm not saying I'm not a religious guy. I have got a faith. I do believe in God. But I mean, your higher power can be your mother that has passed on or your brother or somebody, um, or it can be the group in itself, just something that's a power greater than yourself, you know? So uh, I don't look at it as a chore anymore. I still go to meetings. I still help the newcomer. I still have constant thought of other people. And um, I just try to be selfless a lot of the time and I try giving myself to other people. But like as I spoke earlier on in the podcast, I need to make sure my own glass is full before I can start giving of myself to other people. But I find that when I do give of myself to other people, it takes me away from myself sometimes, which is a good thing. It's a great fellowship. It's it's worldwide. I'm going to America to share my experience, strength and hope in February, on the 28th of February next year. They're flying me over and they put me up in uh, California at some convention. So I'm looking forward to that. Like, you know what I mean? That would never have been possible realistically if you'd have told me, you know, 25 years ago that you'd be sitting in a room with Richie Sadler and Donagat O'Callaghan talking about men's feelings and, you know, I'd be going, would you get the leading boat out of that, you know. But it all, it, it all starts with that conversation by going, I need help. If we, everyone's, yeah. everyone's journey involves that. 100%. We all, in, we, everyone has the, the war stories and most all people in recovery have memories and experiences which they would give every, anything not to have had. Yeah, yeah of course. And, and there's a ripple effect and they've caused difficulty and distress and pain, trauma in some cases to loads of people in their lives. So there's all that. But the 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 healing and the recovery and the growth and the development, all of, all of that stuff that's yeah, available to yeah. people and loads of people all over the world 
go from being active addicts and alcoholics to, to being in recovery, it all at some point involves them going, I need help. Yeah. Richie, I might come just back to you about it. Like you put your hand up, you seek help, but maybe the support structures that are in place, you, you, like you, you'd have a stare for there, honest, would you? I, I haven't had conversations over the years, of it, whether it's a company or a football club yeah. or a rugby club, and say, well, you know, what do we need to put in place for people or, or where do we direct them to? And I think you can put the best services and resources in place, but if the culture isn't there to help a person come forward and say, I, I need access to that service, um, or they don't feel as if they're going to be supported. All the services in the world aren't going to aren't going to work. But th- like, I think first place, we all have a low a, a GP. At any point, you can sit down with your GP and discuss what actually is going on. And if there's other support groups, if there's more kind of deeper health required counselling therapy, like there's 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 so many services all over the country for that. Um, but it comes back to that that thing of going. Here's what it's like being me today and I'm struggling. Mm. And social media is a massive thing for a lot of people as well. I, I, I've used it in really positive ways. You, 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 can, you can see posts or content from people who are dealing with what you're dealing with or they've come through what you're currently dealing with. And, and you can link in with them and they can give you, I have loads, I'm sure you're the same, mm. contact with, by loads of different people who just gone, heard you talk, I, I'm in this do you mind having a chat? And then and then off you go there. Mm-hmm. So social media can be used in loads of really positive ways, but it's also, there's a whole other side to it as well. It can be really, it, it can it, it can really heap on a load of difficulties to people who are in distress already. Yeah, um, okay. But so the services are out there. The main kind of the message is, is to, to find the wherewithal just to begin the conversation and, and, and just, just to, to just to be able to say, do you know what? I'm actually worth this conversation. I'm actually I'm done with struggling. I'm done with suffering. I don't know how better or how quickly my situation is going to improve, but surely it's got to improve from this. But it starts with a conversation. Well, from that moment in the the hospital, you must be so proud of yourself for everything you've gone on to do from from there. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I am. I, I really am. Sometimes I don't take time to kind of acknowledge or see how far that I've come do you know what I mean but when I look back I mean I remember I celebrate my 50th birthday I'm 53 like in June and um, it was COVID when my 50th was on and I'd, I was going to walk the Camino with my daughter myself and my, my youngest daughter I'd planned you know we'll go over and do the Camino do a week and my daughter would be social media and phones and all I said it'd be just a great opportunity spend a little bit of time where I put the phone on the back burner and and do something. I just kind of had a bit of reflection on me fifty and went, Jesus Christ, I've come so far, and I and I've lived a life well beyond my wildest dreams. Like I've just, I'm just kind of the opposite of the person that I was. And I understand now when I look back that I got lost as a child. I was lost and was lost for a long, long time until eventually. You know, I, I I just got sick and tired of being sick and tired and I wanted to do something with my life like and and, and got back to some kind of normality and to some kind of being a better version of myself. Like and I'm very comfortable in my skin. Which cause for so long when I was caught up in active addiction and taking drugs, I would let people literally wipe their feet in me back. You know, and I don't do that anymore. I assert myself, I tell people if I'm not happy that I'm not happy. You know, and I'm just I'm 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 just a completely different person to the person that I was all them years ago, and it's true recovery, and it's true going to meetings, and it's true, you know, networking. So people like walking with me because even though there's a serious kind of side for me, and there is all that trauma and all that stuff, I'm actually a good crack, and I'm okay to be around. Like, <laughs> you know, you're, you're serious crack. No, do you know what I'm saying? No, I mean, like I go into a pub if a night at night, and I'd get up and sing karaoke, and I'd dance, and I'd have a bit of laugh. Like it's not kind of, oh, you know, I can't go in there because I don't drink. Mm. I just don't drink because I don't, I choose not to drink. If people want to have a drink, have a drink. Mm-hmm. Like, don't be thinking because I don't drink. Oh, he doesn't drink, don't have a drink. I'm okay with that. Drink just doesn't agree with me. Like, do you know what I mean? So I always say to people, if you think I'm an idiot, so you want to see me drunk. So uh, it's safer for me and for the world that I stay away from it, you know? Well, what's coming up? What, what have you on? 
Uh, I'm going to be doing a Chadwick's ad with, really? with Joe uh, McGuckin, who I love and admire and I think is a really funny fella. Funny man. Yeah. And uh, a very clever writer and a great actor as well. So I'm really looking forward to that. Come here, if you, I'm on in the Laughter Lounge regularly once a month and come here, you never know where you see me. Oh, I should have been... <laughs> A programme that's on Netflix at the moment, The Gentleman with Guy Ritchie. Yes. I actually auditioned for that, I think, at the park. No way. So, uh, yeah, I'm watching that at the minute and it's it's really, really good. So give it a watch, yeah. And, and Richie, for you, you've teamed up with Chadwick's in her own mental health. Will you tell us a bit about it? I have, yeah. Delighted. They kind of asked me to, to team up and get behind a, a, a campaign called How's the Head. It's kind of all about raising awareness of the mental health concerns that a lot of people in the trades um, industry would have. And it's to kind of promote, like we've been doing in this conversation, to promote the benefits of people in the trades industry speaking to one another about what's going on for them. Um, Chadwick did research, as it was mentioned earlier, 43% of people said that they do have mental health struggles. And as I said earlier, 62% of them have observed others who are struggling. So this isn't, this isn't a thing that's going to impact a small amount of people. This is a, a huge amount of people. So the benefit of a campaign like this, I think, is, is really obvious. Sky's the limit. Yeah. Maybe maybe two or three people in a van are listening to this. Yeah. And, and maybe one or two of them will, will relate to something that they've heard us speaking about. And maybe when the podcast goes off, they'll just start talking about the thing we've just talked about. Yeah. Because I think that's, that's how, I think that's how the change that you asked yeah. about at the start is, is brought about. It's just kind of one chat at a time. It's a ripple. It's a ripple. That's all it is. Yeah. So you're not looking for one big slogan or one big, it's just a couple of lads chatting yeah. that encourages other lads to chat or one lad saying something that encourages the other two to say it too. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. Mm. And the help is there. Mm. You know, the help is there. Like, I mean, if anybody even sees me walking down the street or, you know, wherever, if they've, they've, I'll talk to anybody and I'll help anybody. And it's okay to ask for help. It's all right, you know. That's true, but they will be abusing you over the English jersey. They will, yeah. 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 We'll get through it. We'll hug at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> Lads, honestly, thank you so much for such an honest and open conversation. Thanks really enjoyed it. Pleasure. Good on Thanks you. Thanks so much. Cheers. Welcome back to Under Construction. It is time for our supplier's corner. And of course, um, working on my own isn't my best ability. So Patrick has jumped back in to help us out. Yeah. Patrick, my old role really was putting my head between two arses and pushing. So thankfully, you're getting me out of this hole. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'll give you the gadget. No yeah. problem. We're looking forward to this one today in our supplier's corner. We are delighted to be joined by Aidan Cullen from Wood Concepts. Aidan, how are you? Very good, thanks. Good stuff. And yourself, all we're, good? We're all good, we're all good. Uh, would you give us a brief history or a little synopsis of uh, Wood Concepts? So Wood Concepts started off as an agency business back in 1976 uh, and started trading then as Wood Concepts in the late 90s. Uh, myself and Joe Flynn are the owners of the company and we've developed quite nicely over the years. So Aidan, we've been, we've been trading with you for a long time, you know, and, 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 and Chadwick's and Wood Concepts have a great, great relationship. Um, maybe tell the listeners, listeners a little bit about the products you have and... and uh... Yes, the, the various products we do. So we would do OSB, MDF, plywood. Uh, we do uh, imported timber, which is all C24. And then we do eye joists as well, which we'd like to talk about today. And uh, outside of that, we have other Dorella Steck, which is a... a Peel Clean uh, P5 chipboard that is used as a pla working platform on masonry build houses. So that's basically the product range. Even though it sounds like a small range, there's many skills within all that. Sure, sure. So the engineered eye joist, that's been a game changer really, hasn't it, for the industry? It has. Engineered eye joist probably going more so uh, where we see the demand coming from is Guys who have gone to Australia or to the to the US and come back, US and Australia would have been using them long before, let's say Ireland starts using them. Uh, this one is in Ireland at the moment for engineered joist metal web would be the leader, and most of that is done where you have timber frame, 
manufacturers who are manufacturing their own metal web. Okay, metal web is more expensive than what an eye joist is. So with an eye joist, what we look at is the eye joist is basically a replacement for 9 by 2 and for metal web. It sits in between them in price. Um, 9 by 2 with building regulations today, you can't put any holes through a 9 by 2 without weakening the, the structure. So with an eye joist, you can put your services through it, and it doesn't weaken the structure. It's 30% lighter than timber. It's easier handled on site. Um, and we carry it in stock in four sizes, which cover basically whatever the builder will need. We also offer uh, a free design service. So if we get a drawing from the builder, we'll price it up, tell him what it is, and that'll be his delivered to price site and they're happy to go with that. An awful lot of it is being used at the moment, let's say in renovations, flat roofs, extensions to houses. We have some success with guys who are doing one-off one -off houses in particular. It's obviously a very good substitute for a uh, hollow core as well. And environmentally friendly, carbon neutral, all these things ticks all them boxes as well. And the span can 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 uh, be quite quite good on it as well, can't it? Yeah, it it'll span more than let's say a C twenty four or a C sixteen timber. Mm -hmm. Depends on the depth of the joist. So we can do a two twenty by forty five, for instance, which is your nine by two. So you can get five point one, five point three meter spans, clear spans on that, you, and you don't need any bridging. Dunica's going to talk us through what a C24 yeah, is just now. Exactly. <laughs> I thought that was in Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do find that interesting, Aidan, that, you know, it's people coming maybe from travelling a little bit, seeing something out there, but then ye supplying and, and meeting that want that they have. Yeah, and once a guy has worked with it, he wants to, he wants to continue to do it. And what we found with, call it, we'll call them jobbers for the time being, some of the guys that have used it let's say, a couple building their own house. They'll come to us, send us in a set of drawings. We'll do it, price it up for them, tell them what it is. And then they'll come back and they come back. We'll give it a delivered home price. So we just will talk to whatever Chadwick's branch is nearest to them. Just go to them, pay in there and it's delivered to site. Wow. And it's, a, you know, it's, it's a good service, yeah. but it's, we have to sell it all the way through. But the design end of it really helps them because their engineer can sign off on it. Okay. And obviously we won't do anything till the engineer signs off. This goes back to you, Donica, with your uh, measure twice. Yeah. Once, you know, <laughs> it's the accuracy of that is really important, you know. But it's the ability also to change and the want to change yes. from, say, builders and people that you're around. Right, exactly. And the, the other thing about it is you use the same tools as if you were using ordinary solid timber. You don't have to, lots of machinery or anything to do on it. On site, they can cut the holes in it, cut it to length. And this is things you cannot do with, let's say, metal web. Because once you have metal web, it's that size. If somebody's giving you the, the wrong accurate. size, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're gone. Yeah, yeah. Where it is when you can make the adjustments. We did see a period of inflation uh, post-COVID. And uh, uh, it seems to me, you know, that that, that seems to stabilise now. We were getting less of the the inflation that we had in the marketplace. Would you, are you seeing that? Yes. We, prices have stabilised. Uh, I would say stabilised less in cheap materials at the moment. Um, timber price is still a little bit under pressure. I think it's just an, an oversupply domestically because most European manufacturers will be looking to try and move prices back up. They think it's at their lowest level. But that's all right. They want to move it up. It's, it's what's the guy willing to pay for it here is, is, is where the problem is. Sure. And I, th I think what, what consumers need and even the, the builders who are doing quotes, they just want some consistency, some stability. They, don't, they want yeah. to know that it's not going to jump 20% uh, you know, during the period of the build. And I think, that's, I think we're getting to that point now where we're getting a bit more stability. Yes, no, I, I'd agree with you that we haven't seen a change in prices for, let's say, on cheap materials for the last four months. Okay. Okay, you, you, all these stories that are out now, Suez Canal, uh, container prices starting to move back up. Um, 
we can do nothing about it. If shipping lines decide they're going to increase prices, it's for everybody. Uh, and they will affect the price if that continues or they start sailing around the Cape of Good Hope and then you end up in a situation where you have 12 days or two weeks longer sailing time yeah. and then there's a cost for that as well. And then your stocks, the issues with stocks sure, as well. Sure. Optimistic for the future for the construction industry? Yes, I think there's... We certainly need to build more houses um, and I wouldn't be the first one to be saying that, but uh, I think we, we'll get there. I'm not sure if a lot of, a lot of what we see, see and hear is this modular building off-site and everything like that, but we are not involved in that side of, side of the business. That's more or less Chadwick's end of it to, to get these guys. The timber frame is certainly the biggest builder at the moment. So with them guys are, are seem to be busy, but a lot of them are quite flat out at the moment and sure. no extra capacity there. Yeah, no, for sure. Aidan, thanks a million for coming in and uh, sharing with us the, uh, the history of your company and, and the great products that you have. Great to see you. We'll see you again soon. Thanks, Patrick. Cheers, Thanks, Aidan. Sonica. Thanks, William. Thank you. If you have been affected by any of the issues discussed on this podcast, you can find support at the Samaritans.org or call 116123. Construction workers can also contact lighthouseclub.org or call 1800 939122 or text hardhat to 50808. Otherwise, contact your local GP. If you are outside the Republic of Ireland, please contact organisations in your country.